Great. Um, well, thank you for the introduction, and, and thank you all for coming today. I'm, you know, I'm a geologist. I'm perhaps an unusual person to be kicking today off because uh, what I look at, what I study, is the realm of deep time. And so, how did a geologist come to write a book about, you know, equating soil security and national security, and looking at the way that people have treated land over centuries and millennia has actually greatly affected the ability of the land to support human societies over comparable time frames. And that story is kind of a long story, but I suffice it to say I've been interested in the subject for a long time. And a few years ago, I wrote this book. Uh, and part of it is motivated because I really think that we need to start seeing soil as a strategic resource. What do we tend to think of as strategic resources? We tend to think of oil, first of all. We think of water. Some will think of the atmosphere and issues of climate change. What we don't tend to hear about in terms of a societal level or global conversations is really about the protecting our most fundamental resource, the resource upon which, I argue, society depends, and that's the soil. We need to start thinking of it as a strategic resource. And the reality is, is that global soil degradation is really probably the biggest underappreciated environmental crisis that humanity faces over the next century. And this book, Dirt, is an attempt to, to go into that problem in terms of its historical perspective and talk a little bit about where we might go in, in the future. Um, and I'll make no apology uh, up front for the title. I know that you are never, ever supposed to call soil dirt. That's what I was taught in grad school. It was the, the cardinal sin of soil science. So of course, when I wrote the book about the importance of soil, I had to call it dirt. Um, could never follow directions very well. Um, so what's the magnitude of the extent of the global soil degradation problem? Well, this map from the United Nations kind of captures it. It shows the world and the extent of areas of either very degraded soil or degraded soil. The definitions are kind of loose, but the coverage is global. You could find areas within each of those red zones on the map that show very degraded soil in which there are incredibly well-managed farms that are building soil. This is painting with an incredibly broad brush. The point, though, is, is that we're doing this at a global scale. I'll show you data, I'll go through some of the numbers uh, in a little bit, but the, suffice it to say that we don't really have any new land that we can move on to should we exhaust the lands that we're farming globally today. And this map, I think, makes that point quite well. And also, if you just overlay in your mind the global distribution of a population, you'll notice that it corresponds reasonably well with a lot of those uh, colored areas on the map. So if soil degradation is a global problem, just how bad is it in terms of real numbers? Well, the quote that I like to use is from a paper David Pemmental wrote a, um, a couple decades ago that is, captures the state of the problem uh, back in the early 1990s. And since the Second World War, over the second half of the 20th century, soil erosion caused farmers to abandon, on a global basis, something like 430 million hectares of arable land. That's the equivalent of about one-third of all the available cropland on the planet at present. An area the size of India and China combined has been abandoned since the Second World War due to soil loss and land degradation. Now, if you think about the problem of how we're going to feed, the very real problem of how we're going to feed the world 50 or 100 years from now, the kind of time frame that to a geologist like myself is actually not very much time at all. Um, it would certainly, you know, the first conclusion you can come to is it would really be useful to have all the world's farmland and cropland available at its full productive capacity the way it may have been in the past. That's obviously not the case today, but it puts a point um, on the issue. The second line up there about sort of how fast the rate of global soil loss is uh, quantitatively shows its new soil, that the rate of world soil erosion in excess of soil production is on the order of 23 billion tons per year. That's about 0.7% net loss per year of the world's global cropland soil inventory. Now, that's less than 1% a year. It doesn't seem like a really big number until you sort of turn that around and go, oh, okay, at the rate that we've been going, how long would it take to actually completely exhaust our supply of fertile topsoil in the world? And you crunch the numbers, and it's about a century and a half. Now, to a geologist, that's scarily fast. And I'm not standing here in front of you today saying that the world is actually going to run out of soil or dirt. Obviously, other kinds of social, economic, and cultural factors will come into play before we erode off the last piece of soil off of farmland in the world. But the point is, is that we simply cannot continue at the pace that we're going today without engineering a crisis of some sort over a time frame that, to a geologist, is scarily fast. In other words, this century, the issue of global soil loss 
is going to come to a head and something must change. Unless, and it would behoove us, if we want to control what that outcome is, to actually influence this trajectory. So it's a global problem. And if we look at that in terms of its long-term effect on societies, we need to look at it in the context of what are the kind of things that actually influences the longevity of human societies. And there's really sort of three things that people tend to put to the fore when they analyze this problem. Um, those are things like climate change. The graph up in the upper left-hand corner of the screen shows you the global temperature plot through the course of the Little Ice Age. And where that curve dips down and it gets really cold is where the Viking colony in Greenland got wiped out because it was too cold for them to actually persist there. They were established in a warm period. Cold snap drove them out. They, um, well, their descendants have stayed, but it's not quite the same. Um, so there's no doubt that climate changes can actually influence human societies. There were dynasties in Egypt that were, um, that were done in by droughts. Um, climate change can matter in, in the in the past. I'm not going to talk about it, what that might do in the future. In terms of natural disasters, uh, it's very clear that natural disasters can influence the longevity of small societies. Take the, the small um, island state, Bronze Age island state from 3,000 years ago on the island of Santorini in the Mediterranean. They built their homeland on a place that looked a lot like Mount St. Helens up there in the upper right. They built on an active volcano. Why would they build their home city on an active volcano in the middle of the Mediterranean when there's lots of other nice places and the islands to build on? They had geothermally plumbed hot water in the Bronze Age 3,000 years ago. They were the one of the most luxurious, comfortable societies at the time. They were just incredibly poorly sited. And the lesson of their civilization and its demise is that natural disasters can greatly impact very small societies. But if you think about the problem of a natural disaster and the longevity of a society, there's a fundamental scale dependence. A big society, a global society, can move aid from an unaffected area to actually help people in an affected area, um, at least in principle, despite all the, the logistical and political difficulties that can entail. So scale matters in terms of natural disasters. And then the lower left-hand corner up there, politics, war, and social evolution, those are the kind of things that you actually read in history textbooks about what controls the fate and course of human civilizations. Why? Well, because that's the stuff that's really of fundamental interest to historians, and it does matter. Rome didn't fall simply because the last bit of soil was eroded off of central Italy. It fell because the Visigoths knocked on the door and, and um, rather impolitely. But the, the point being here is that I want to ask is what about soil? Preservation of the soil itself as a physical body and its fertility is the fundamental condition for actually sustaining an agricultural society over any meaningful time frame to a geologist. And this book, Dirt, is essentially my way of trying to explore how that theme has played out through, uh, through history. And obviously, if the answer was soil was not important, I wouldn't have finished the book and I wouldn't be talking to you about this issue today. So I've kind of given away my punchline at the cover of the book, but bear with me, if you will. Um, if you look back at some environmental history textbooks, you'll find the argument that soil erosion resulted, resulting from deforestation, from forest clearing, was one of the reasons behind the demise of ancient societies around the world. All those societies over on the right-hand side of the screen are places where people have made that argument, and I could actually extend that list down, wrap it around two or three more screens down below the, the screen if I wanted to, and I tried to go into all the historical detail I could find in the book. Uh, but the point is, uh, or one key point, is that I don't think deforestation can actually be the answer for a very simple reason. And that reason is that trees grow back pretty fast. I actually cut my geomorphological teeth, because that's what I am. I'm a geomorphologist, a geologist who studies surface topography, erosion, the evolution of mountains, what rivers do. Um, and I cut my geomorphological teeth in the Oregon Coast Range. It's a place where this, we're on, I think, the third round of forest clearing in the, the area I was studying. And you could document that landslides actually are accelerated when you cut big trees off steep slopes, the roots decay, and you, you know, the soil can actually uh, slide eat more easily. But if you crunch the numbers, it just doesn't work for explaining wholesale soil loss over broad regions of terrain the way that people have argued influenced ancient societies. You could explain big impacts to river systems, but not necessarily to the whole landscape. Uh, and this led me to ask the question is, was the culprit in ancient societies actually the agriculture that followed deforestation? Was it the plow and not the ax that was actually responsible for the large-scale loss of soil over large areas of the, of the classical world? In other words, the, 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 our, the question I tried to wrestle with in this book is, could agricultural soil erosion and degradation limit the lifespan of civilizations?
Now again, if the answer was no, I would have written a different book or maybe a romance novel, I don't know, but I've given away the, the, the answer. What I want to share with you is a little bit of the historical detail and also some of the data that I really couldn't put into a popular book because I was told, well, I was advised that if you put XY plots with graphs and lots of data, anyone that goes into Barnes & Noble to actually buy your book will open it up and go, oh, how nice, and put it back on the, on the table. But I want to uh, show you guys at least some of the data behind the argument. Uh, but let me walk you through the way that a geomorphologist actually thinks about soil, so you can see where I'm coming from on this. Then I'll go through some of the historical data. Then I'll show you some of the modern quantitative data that backs up the argument based on the historical data. And then I'll talk a little bit about the future. Um, so somebody like me thinks about soil a lot like this. Uh, soil is something that is produced from the weathering of rocks, it's the breakdown of rocks, and the combination with organic matter. I think of soil as the frontier between geology and biology. The, um, and soil is really a place where it's the mixing of the, in, of the inert, the non-living, and the living. And so soils are produced from the weathering and breakdown of rocks uh, that can be transported or blown by the wind or moved somewhere. But this, in this simple diagram, rocks are breaking down, mixing with organic matter, whether the roots of that tree or the trunk of it when it falls over and starts to rot. That material be, makes the soil. But all soils are also eroding. If, it's on any, if you're on any kind of a sloping surface, even a sort of a half a degree gentle slope, you can think of the soil as a moving traction carpet. Every time you walk on it, every pass of the plow, every time a buffalo moved and kicked a stone, things are going downhill a little bit. And if you think about a soil, it's reflecting this balance between the weathering of rocks and the erosion of material off that surface. You can start thinking about the soil. Uh, and the analogy I use for the students in my um, geomorphology class at the University of Washington is to think about soil like your bank account. You have income, that's the weathering of rocks to make new soil. You have expenses, that's erosion off the landscape. And the standing stock of soil is like your savings. And this kind of gets through to them. They kind of under, understand that. And if you think about any kind of a system that's like that, that's produced, that can be lost, and that has a storage element, if you burn it up, if you spend, if you erode, faster than your income allows you to sustain your savings, then you are, in fact, burning your savings up. So on any environment where erosion of the soil is occurring faster than it's being produced, you're actually losing soil. Now, soils are also one of the most diverse landforms uh, on the planet. Under native vegetation, a typical soil will develop that reflects local conditions. And you all know this. In different soils in different regions are different. Different soils in different parts of the single farm can be very different. No real mystery there. It's the climate, the vegetation, the geology, the topography. Hans Sieni's famous factors of soil formation all influence the soil. The common element, though, soils worldwide, are if they're eroding faster than they're being produced, you're actually losing it. So what happened historically? Well, the invention of the plow fundamentally altered the balance between soil production and soil erosion at the surface of the earth, dramatically increasing soil erosion by a factor of anywhere from 10 to 100, as I'll show you in a few minutes, uh, when viewed through the thick glasses of a geologist at a global scale. Now, why is this? Well, think about the kinds of environments you may have seen naturally. A natural grassland, a forest, how much bare soil, how much bare earth do you actually find in them? Not much. Then think about what a plow actually does in terms of leaving the ground bare and vulnerable for erosion in the time between plowing and the time between the leaf out of whatever grows next. Um, there's a window in which if you get a single rainstorm, you can actually cause decades to centuries worth of erosion when measured in units of the rate of soil production. And it's that imbalance that has actually fueled the loss of soil in ancient societies around the world and is indeed still active at a global scale today. So let me take you back to classical Greece. Why do I want to start with classical Greece? It's one of the places where the historical data has been most clearly documented. A place where geologists and archaeologists worked together to do the geoarchaeology of what happened to this landscape at a time when people were the dominant force shaping the landscape. And it turns out that cycles of erosion and soil formation in ancient Greece began in the Bronze Age, about 1,500 years before the time of Christ right after the introduction of plow-based agriculture. The plow arri arrived in the Greek landscape from uh, uh, areas to the east, and the soils literally started being stripped off the Greek landscape. This, this uh, slide shows you the uh, reconstruction of the Greek landscape right after deglaciation, sort of before agriculture arrived in the Greek landscape. It was open oak woodland, where you can see those um, uh, about a one to three foot thick soil on the hillsides, alluvium down in the valley bottoms, river deposits. Um, and so it's mostly sort of a thin soil over rock. 
Farming in the Greek landscape started originally in the, in the valley bottoms along the rivers. Why? Well, it was, it was flat lying, relatively easily worked land that was well watered. But as the population rose, um, uh, agriculture spread up onto the hillsides so that they could essentially uh, support more people. When that started, though, and cultivation spread up onto the bedrock hillsides that had thin soils, um, it started the clock ticking on the rate of, with the rate of soil loss being greater than the rate of soil reproduction out of the bedrock. And eventually, the soils on the hillsides ended up washing down to the valley bottoms. Um, and this created a fundamental problem. Because, as you're all well aware, the productivity of the land doesn't necessarily depend on the total volume of soil in the landscape. It's the surface area of the soil that really, that really matters. And the depth matters, the fertility matters, and all that. But if you take all your soil on a landscape that was in a thin layer and you pile it up in the valley bottoms, you have less land that you can work. There's less people that you'd actually be able to support. This is the story, in great part, of classical Greece. You can find areas on the hillside still where the, you can find Bronze Age agricultural implements in land where there's no soil on the surface, but they were clearly growing grains a couple thousand years ago. What happened in the Greek landscape? It's one of those places where you can actually trace the rise and fall of three successive civilizations on the same piece of land. And I like to use this example because there's very few other, very few other places where that trend has played through several times. This shows you the plot of the population density of the southern Argola, the particular valley in southern Greece, uh, from about 6,000 BC over here by me to about the present over there on the far side, um, and number of people that the valley could support on the vertical axis. And you'll notice that there's three cycles. There's a run-up of population in the Bronze Age, a crash before the age of classical Greece, a second rise, a second crash in a dark age, and then the, uh, the rise to the modern age. Now, there's two aspects of this curve that got me really interested. And this is actually the figure that I found that started me off on writing this book. Now, one of those aspects of this curve is actually fairly trivial, which is why does the amplitude of the population cycle go up each cycle? And the simple answer is technology. We've got far better technology today than we had in the Bronze Age. We've got fertilizers. We've got um, mechanized equipment. We can actually grow a lot more land, per, a lot more food per hectare, support more people per hectare of land uh, than they could in, when they just had oxen and digging sticks. No real mystery there at all. But what about the periodicity of the cycle? Why this rise, crash, rise, crash, rise? And of course, the question that people usually want to know is, well, what's going to happen off the right-hand side of the screen? What does this actually mean for the future? And is there an analogy to the global scale that we can make? Um, that's what really got me interested in this problem. Why a couple thousand year run up, and then a gap of a few thousand years in between successive societies on the same piece of land? Now, there's nothing from this graph that would uh, tell you the sort of the pace of agricultural soil loss, whether or not the hypothesis I have offered at the start could explain this. So bear in mind that you know, a few thousand years as a time scale to strip soil off the land, when we get to looking at the data in a few minutes, keep those numbers in mind in terms of the time frame, because I'll come back to that. One of the things I wanted to do in looking at the real data from, uh, from the modern data, because there weren't geomorphologists running around measuring soil loss in the Bronze Age or in the age of classical Greece, we we'll see if the numbers actually pan out. But I'm not trying to take credit for the idea that soil loss can influence the fate of human societies. Plato, back in the fourth century BC, actually formulated this idea. He's the first person to, to sort of literally formulate the idea that the way people treat land will, in the end, affect the, the duration over which the land can actually support human populations. Uh, he was looking at the Greek landscape in the Classical Age and, and noticed the effects of erosion in the Bronze Age. And in his words, in describing uh, what he saw, he wrote that the rich, soft soil of the, central, of the southern Greek landscape has all run away, leaving the land nothing but skin and bone. But in those days, the damage had not taken place. The hills had high crests. The rocky plain of Thales was covered with rich soil, and the mountains were covered by thick woods, of which there are some traces today. Plato was noticing things like trees on pedestals of soil around which uh, the farmers plowed um, and had left undisturbed. And they sat you know, decimeters to a meter up above the surrounding terrain. And he, he put together that the degradation of the Greek landscape had limited its ability to actually support the population that it would need to raise large armies to keep people from the east from actually overrunning the Greek peninsula. So he put, he put together this idea that soil erosion can influence the fate of human societies long before, um, well, <laughs> long before Western civilization moved on 
past the Greek landscape. So it's one of the oldest ideas that we actually have in the sort of scientific or pseudoscientific literature, and it was long forgotten, perhaps because Plato wrote about it in the dialogue in which he addressed the history of Atlantis. It was not viewed as his most credible um, document when people started unearthing Greek lands, uh, manuscripts in the, in, the, in the Renaissance. Well, let me skip over a whole mess of societies between the classical Greeks and colonial North America. Um, I encourage you to all to look into the, the, the many of the lessons are the same. The Roman heartland um, uh, experienced a very similar story to the Greek landscape. Um, as did other areas, northern China, Easter Island, uh, north and Africa. Um, very few parts of the world lack a story of a civilization that was undone by long-term soil loss. But let me talk a little bit about the colonial North America and the United States because, um, well, that's our country. Um, the earliest sort of economically viable thing that kept the, the southeastern United States in business was growing tobacco. It was incredibly productive. Uh, uh, crop economically, but you could only get about three to five years of production out of a freshly cleared piece of land before you needed to move on and clear another piece of land. Um, this actually uh, uh, gave rise to several um, phenomena, um, not the least of which was very strong differences in the philosophy of how to look at soils in North America and in Europe. In Europe at the time, in the 17th and 18th centuries, land was very expensive and labor was cheap. My ancestors were being kicked out of Europe as fast as the Scots could actually figure out how to get rid of us, and, um, and land was very cheap, and land was expensive. Ideas of soil husbandry, crop rotations, uh, different ways to treat the land and actually conserve soil and build fertility started to actually be really developed in, in Europe at that time because of the expense of land. In North America, on the other hand, Land was cheap and labor was, uh, was expensive. And so the economic model had evolved into plantation agriculture where you needed a large amount of land um, and you moved your labor around on it. Um, and so it's the idea of soil conservation didn't really take root in colonial North America because land was cheap. It was one of the cheapest inputs to, ag to agricultural production. But the degradation of land, the declining soil fertility in colonial fields actually worried people like George Washington, like Thomas Jefferson, the sort of the usual suspects we can talk about in terms of the founding fathers. Um, Washington was so concerned about it that he experimented with ways to actually control erosion on his lands. And he wrote in a letter to Alexander Hamilton in 1796 that a few years more of increased sterility will drive the inhabitants of the Atlantic states westward for support whereas if they were taught how to improve the old instead of going in pursuit of new and productive soils they would make these acres, which now scarcely yield them, anything, yield them anything, turn out beneficial to themselves. But Washington was arguing was that the declining crop yields that they were, the plantation owners were experiencing in eastern North America would eventually drive the United States as a society over the Appalachians to the fresh soils of Kentucky and Tennessee and the American South, um, not because of a manifest destiny to civilize the continent. That, that rationale was a reverse engineered one at the late 19th century. Washington forecast the state of what would happen simply by looking at the state of the land and realizing that a nation of farmers would need access to the fresh land on the other side of the mountains if they were to stay in business as an agricultural civilization. And his prognosis was fairly well borne out. Um, a lot of the, um, well, the, a lot of the Piedmont country, the uh, hill country, the upland country in the southeast was you know, not abandoned, but, but the population density crashed in the early 19th century as farmers moved to the other side of the mountains to take advantage of the fresh soils on that side. How bad, though, was the magnitude of historical soil erosion? So far, I've, I haven't shown you any real data. I've shown you arguments and anecdotes from societies. This map, though, shows you a, this gray noodle that extends from Alabama in the lower left to Virginia in the upper right that shows you the magnitude of post-colonial soil loss and along the eastern seaboard in the Piedmont country, the upland country. We, so we're not talking about the coastal plains, we're not talking about the Appalachians, just the, the hill country. Four to ten inches of erosion, some places more than ten inches, off of this whole region in less than 200 years. Now, is that a big deal or a small deal? You guys probably have a better clue than most audiences I talk to about this, but there was only about 12 inches of fertile, rich black topsoil on the Piedmont country to begin with. So if we could actually erode off a third to darn near all of the fertile topsoil off of what was originally one of the major production areas of our country in just two centuries, think what, it kind of puts the, it makes it 
not unimaginable to think that the Greeks, with a thousand year run at it, with five times as long, with roughly the same kind of technology. Because the, the basic technology behind the plow hasn't changed that much in thousands of years. The um, size of them and what we can pull them around with has, but the basic idea hadn't by then. It puts the idea that the Romans and the Greeks and the Easter Islanders and the Chinese could do could lose enough of their soil to take production out over large areas into perspective that it's not an unreasonable hypothesis. And if you look at my home state of Washington, um, we can also look at the simple question as whether the problem of soil erosion is still a current one. This one, and why a geologist like myself would view a photograph like this of a winter wheat field in the Palouse um, as you know, a slow motion disaster in the making. All those little channels, those little rills that you could plow right across, that you could sort of erase with a single pass, or if they form every year, if they form after, uh, you know, conceivably after a single rainfall, over time, the way a geologist integrates time, they can add up to big effects fairly readily. And if we look at uh, this photograph that Vern Kaiser shot in the Palouse in 1961, it illustrates why a geologist like me would look at that last slide and just go, wow, what is happening here? Um, this is a... Um, area where there's a water cistern up in the upper right-hand corner um, behind that fence. And those two orange lines show the surface of the ground in 1911 when the field was first cleared. Uh, and nothing happened in this field other than it was, uh, it was manually plowed and winter wheat was the crop. By 1961, the land was down to that lower surface. And just to the right of 1961, there's a little black vertical thing you can probably barely see. That's a one-foot increment on a stadia rod that was in the photograph that's kind of washed out in the negative. So you've had roughly five feet of erosion off this spot in 50 years. That's a foot a decade, about an inch a year. And there's almost nowhere in the planet, well, in fact, there is nowhere on the planet where soils form at the pace of an inch a year. The only place you could possibly get that would be dust fall or volcanic ash or something. Um, and now, of course, this is an extreme example. That's why I've selected it and want to use it. You should be sitting there going, oh, well, this is extreme. This is not going to be typical of everywhere in the world. And you would be right about that. So let's look at the actual data that where we might be able to draw what is, and ask the question, what's the average pace of agricultural soil loss at a global scale? To answer that question, which you need to answer to get back to my original question of is the, agricultural, is the pace of agricultural soil loss fast enough that it could explain the long-term loss of soil that we could take out societies, I did something to answer that that has actually gotten to be extremely hard to get students to do it at a modern university. Um, and that is, quite simply, I went to the library. <laughs> and, and it's really hard to get them to do that now. So when my students were off doing field work, I had three weeks. And, I gave, and why did I have three weeks? Well, it was the hole in the, my schedule that I had. So I went to the library and I vacuumed up all the data I could possibly find on simply how fast are agricultural fields eroding worldwide, who's published numbers that I could bring into a spreadsheet and analyze, how fast is, is the world's topography eroding naturally, the long-term geological rate. Because if you think about the long-term rate of geological erosion, that's got to be about the long-term rate of soil production, or there wouldn't be soil everywhere all over the landscape. Um, and I basically harvested these numbers and looked at them. And this is essentially what I found. This is the, the data that I vacuumed up. I found 1,400 studies. Uh, and why was it 1,400? Well, that's I, when I ran out of three weeks, I ran out of time, and that's what I had. And besides, at that time, I had enough of the library. Um, so I looked at agricultural erosion rates and geological erosion rates. And at, down at the bottom, you'll note that I did not include any sediment yield estimates. These are all point erosions of what was actually happening on a field or at a place, not what happens as you integrate downstream along a basin. Because if, you know, if you'd run the thought experiment, if you're just measuring the amount of sediment that comes down a river, if there happens to be a dam somewhere in the river system, then you're not really measuring the erosion rate off the landscape. So I didn't look at sediment yields, just point measurements. And I did not use any uh, universal soil loss equation-based estimates. Why not? Well, I know that that model as often wildly overestimates as it wildly underestimates. And I wanted real data, not model data. Um, so. This is all real data. There's only one axis to the plot. It's erosion rate across the bottom. And the vertical axis are, it's just to separate different data, different data sets and sources. So each of those dots you see up there is a number from a paper that somebody's published in the peer-reviewed literature. And the white data sets, there's, four, there's three of them. There's areas that are cratons. Those are 
um, so the flat, dead parts of continents. That's, uh, uh, it's like the American Midwest, like the heart of Africa, like the Amazon Basin, uh, Central Australia, places that are tectonically, and by dead I mean geologically dead, where continents are not smashing together, where things have been eroding for a long time, the relief is fairly low, not mountains in other words. Um, and cratons, as you'll see up there, erode from at the, the left-hand side, you get down to 0 0.0001 millimeters a year. That's one ten thousandth of a millimeter a year. And if anybody here can figure out how to measure something happening at a pace of a ten thousandth of a millimeter a year in real time, let us know. It, it, that would be really very, very clever. Um, it's so slow, it's hard to figure out how to measure it. Um, and those areas, also, at the high end, they wrote it about a 1% of a millimeter a year, a hundredth of a millimeter a year. So re relatively flat areas, that's about what you should expect for the long-term natural rate of erosion, which is about the long-term natural rate of soil production. The soil mantle terrain, the next line up, goes from about a thousandth of a millimeter a year up to about a millimeter a year at the highest, uh, at the highest end. And actually, we just had a bit of data we can add now from New Zealand that would push that up to maybe two millimeters a year. But you're not getting much more than two millimeters here, and in those environments, it's like steep parts of New Zealand. Um, and if you think about, well, and then the alpine and glaciated terrain, that third long-term natural data set, those are real mountains. Things like the Andes, like the Himalaya, like the Cascades, like the Swiss Alps. Places we don't tend to farm because the soils are very thin and it's really steep. Um, you don't farm mountains unless that's all the land you have. The Nepalis farm mountains, but that's all the land they have. Um, so in natural landscapes, places that erode more than about a millimeter a year, you're talking high mountains. Now look at the, um, the data that's labeled agriculture. That data is from conventional plow-based agriculture around the world. It's not just in the developed world, it's in the developing world, the developed world, anywhere where it's essentially uh, plow-based and the land is bare for some part of the year. And you'll notice it's quite a spread from about 0.1 millimeter a year up to you know, getting close to a tenth of a meter a year. Um, on average, and if you play the game of looking at, okay, which of these natural geologic contexts is plow-based agriculture most like, you're led to the very uncomfortable conclusion that viewed globally through a mass, through a brute force data compilation like this, conventional farms erode like steep alpine topography. We've managed to turn places like Kansas and Tennessee and Texas into places that erode like the high Himalaya, and at a global scale. And that really is quite an achievement, and frankly, it's not a sustainable one, um, for the simple reasons expressed on this graph. Now, to be fair, this graph is the bad news graph. Um, this graph is the good news graph. Why? Well, I've added four more data sets. Um, and what I have here is it's now it's, it's a double axis graph. The erosion rate is now the vertical axis, and the horizontal axis is just the rank ordered number in percentile of all the data I had. So the, f the median data number would be the 50th percentile, um, and this, the smallest value would be on the left, highest value on the right. Um, and what I have shown are the same data I had in the last slide, probability distributions for the long-term geological erosion rate and for plow-based agriculture. So that upper, red, uh, that upper black line is the conventional agriculture. The lower black line is the long-term geological erosion rate. And you'll notice there's three other uh, white data sets that plot right on top of the long-term geological erosion one. That's the good news, because what that data is, is it's long-term rates of soil production, the little circles. Those are, there's been a cottage industry in the last couple of decades of people figuring out how to quantify how fast are soils actually made worldwide. And th that data plots right on top of the long-term geological erosion rate. So that idea that soils come into a balance, that the rate of soil erosion is matched by the rate of soil production in natural environments is actually borne out by the global data. The second one that I want to show you is the little triangles that are on there. And you probably can't discriminate at this scale the, the three white data sets that plot on top of each other. But the little triangles that's labeled native is erosion rates under native vegetation. The rates of erosion under native vegetation are right on top of rates of soil production or right on top of rates of long-term geological erosion. In other words, the natural world of soil production and erosion and vegetation, it's all integrated in a way that balances to maintain the soil at the surface of the earth. If it wasn't, we, there's enough geological time to play with that if erosion was faster than soil production on a geological basis, we wouldn't have soil. If soil production was a lot faster than, um, than erosion on a geological basis, we'd have you know, miles of soil. It's a finely balanced system at a global scale. 
The good news lies in that lower white uh, data set, the little diamonds. That's conservation agriculture, the way I've turned it on this graph. Um, now, what that is, is it's dominantly no-till agriculture. There's some data from um, terraced agriculture, but almost all the data in this data set are from studies where people have looked at no-till agriculture. And the good news is that plots right on top of the long-term geological erosion rate data. In other words, to farm sustainably in a way that maintains the soil, we don't have to cut erosion down to zero. What we need to get it to is about what the long-term rate of soil production is, and no-till agriculture demonstrably does that. So the good news is that the problem with long-term soil loss is not because humanity farms. The bad news is that's because it's how we farm, from how we use the plow. The good news is that we can farm in ways that will actually sustain the soil over periods of time a geologist would think of as sustainable. But the bad news is that the methods that we would use to do that are currently called um, alternative agriculture. We need to basically make those kinds of alternatives, things like no plow agriculture, standard practice rather than alternative practices. Now, just uh, to share the, the data with you, and again, I was told I really shouldn't be showing plots like I've just shown the last two slides or data like this to in, a, in, a popular, in a popular audience book, but the data is compelling, so I want to share it with you. Um, this is the data. If you take all the data that I compiled in that library exploration, put it all into a single um, thing, and look at either the median or the mean, take whichever kind of average you like, the 50th percentile, or just add them all up and divide by the numbers for the mean, and you look globally, conventional, and again, plow-based agriculture ranges from a millimeter and a half a year to up to about four millimeters a year in terms of, of net average soil loss. Um, and we can go conservative, call it a millimeter and a half for what I'm going to do next with it. But compare all those blue numbers down at the bottom. Uh, the erosion rates under no-till agriculture, less than a tenth of a millimeter a year. Uh, erosion rates under native vegetation, about the same, tenth of a millimeter a year. Long-term rates of soil production, a little bit higher, but still about a tenth of a uh, uh, actually, the native vegetation is down almost a 1%, a hundredth of a millimeter a year, as is soil production, and the long-term geological erosion rate, about 3% of a millimeter per year. Um, I'm not going to argue that any of those blue numbers are really different from each other. They're probably, the data is sort of variable enough um, that I'm not going to discriminate between those. But all those blue numbers are certainly different than that red number. There's a long-term, in other words, net loss of soil on the order of somewhere north of a millimeter a year. If we look at the longest time frame over which people can look at soil erosion, too, the entire history of the continent since plants evolved, the last four or 500 million years, we come to a similar conclusion about the state of things today. There's a guy at the University of Michigan, uh, Bruce Wilkinson, who had the audacity to try and figure out the rate at which the continents eroded over geologic time. And he figured out that for the last half a billion years, the last 500 million years, continents eroded at a rate of about an inch every 1,400 years. Well, the USDA argues the rate of soil production today at present, which is an overestimate, is about an inch every 500 years, an overestimate for a global average. Um, and if you look at that, that sort of balance, if the average erosion rate was an inch every 1,400 years and the average rate of soil production was an inch every 500 years, you would expect that over time, soils would have been building on the continents, which is what we see in the geologic record. If you look today, though, the average rate of soil erosion at present is about an inch every 60 years. We've flipped it on its head. We're no longer building soils globally. We're eroding soils globally at a pace that's arguably about 10 or maybe more times faster than they're being produced. In other words, we literally are running out of fertile soil. Well, has this happened in the past, and was it fast? Is this kind of a pace fast enough to actually explain um, the, the story of ancient societies? Well, if we do a little simple math in our heads, we can figure that out. If we take that net soil loss of about a millimeter a year, it implies erosion of a typical half meter to one meter thick soil would occur in about 500 to 1,000 years. And that's approximately the time span of most major civilizations outside of the big river floodplains where societies have maintained, been maintained for thousands of years. Things like the Nile, the Tigris, the Euphrates, uh, the rivers in China. Why are those the exceptions to the rule? Well. Egypt was fertilized by the soils of Ethiopia that were eroded off of Ethiopia and delivered down the Nile and spread annually on the fields of Egypt. Um, I think that this coincidence, if you want to call it that, between the time frame you would calculate from long-term rates, so, uh, uh, from rates of soil loss on conventionally worked fields today, penciling out to be about right for explaining the longevity of societies around the world 
in different regions and in different contexts, all with, with the common element being essentially the use of agricultural techniques like the plow that left the land barren and vulnerable for erosion for some part of the year as the common element. I think that that's not a coincidence, and I'm not the first person to think so. Walter Loudermilk, 50 years ago, wrote that here in a nutshell, so to speak, we have the underlying hazard of civilization. For by clearing and cultivating sloping lands, for most of our lands are more or less sloping, we expose soils to accelerated erosion by water or by wind. And in doing that upon this, we enter upon a regime of self-destructive agriculture. Uh, louder milk, I think, was right on the money in terms of the problem of soil erosion and the problem of, of the plow. And awareness, of course, in the aftermath of the Dust Bowl reached to the highest levels of American society, where President Franklin Delano Roosevelt wrote that a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. His words are as, I think, prophetic and profound today as they were in the aftermath of the Dust Bowl, and perhaps more so if we think at a global scale and you think out over the next 50 or 100 years. This, of course, begs the question of is soil restoration possible? Can we actually reverse this historical pattern? Can we not relearn, or can we not relive, can we learn and not relive uh, the lessons of ancient societies? Can we reverse that historical pattern? How would we do that? Well, if the problems have been rooted in our agricultural practices in the past, um, and the big one being essentially the plow in terms of the vulnerability of erosion, well, if the, ant, the problem was in agriculture, well, then the solution lies in agriculture as well. Um, what could we do? I'm probably the wrong person to ask for the policy prescription. This audience would be a better people to ask for how to actually do that. But from where I sit, we could reduce subsidies for conventional erosive farming practices. We should not be rewarding people who degrade their land. We should be encouraging people who improve their land and sustain soil fertility. We could increase support for no-till practices on lands where they're suitable, which may very well be everywhere. Uh, but again, I'm the wrong, you know, geologist is not the person to get that answer from. Other people at this conference are. But we could also promote practices that increase soil organic matter to both sequester carbon and improve soil fertility. And if you look down that list, the, uh, the growth of no-till agriculture can actually help with, with all of these. And I actually know that the idea of rebuilding soil can happen far faster than I would have guessed when I was riding dirt, in great part because of lessons that my wife taught me in our yard. She's a gardener. We live in North Seattle. Um, and she basically has uh, turned what was a bare till landscape. We had glacial till. There wasn't a lick of organic matter in it, not a living worm in our yard. Over the course of about eight years, she built a couple inches of soil. Those are her pruning shears up there to give you a little bit of sense of scale at the, about the, na the bad stuff we have below and the soil she's built on top. And how does she do it? With, basically with organic matter and, and her own labor, two things that we have surpluses of in cities. But the key thing here, I think the key element here, is organic matter. Um, the return of organic matter to the land, uh, the retention of it on the land, turn out to be very central to building soil and to, to fostering life in the soil. And the idea that people can build soils, can restore soils far faster than nature left to her own devices could is actually one that is borne out by the historical record, not with as many examples as there are of societies that degraded their land, but that with equal clarity. There's places where, like, um, if you think about the Dutch when they walled off their lands from the sea, once they were hemmed in by their neighbors and they ran out of land, they started to basically to dike off the sea, and this, the thing on the left-hand side of the screen labeled Plagen shows you an example of one of the Plagen soils in Europe, some of the best agricultural soils in Europe that are developed on beach sand. How did the Dutch do that? They did it over the course of a few decades in the, um, of intensively returning their urban organic waste to the land. Same thing that my wife did in our yard. They returned organic matter to the land and basically aggressively worked to build up their soils over decades. And now they've got some of the best agricultural land in Europe in areas that you know, a few centuries ago were seabed. In the Amazon basin, the natives of the Amazon built the fertile, rich, black earth soils known as the terra preta soils. How did they do it? With their organic wastes. Um, I personally believe they did it by accident um, in terms of they always had fires going and they took their charcoal out, dumped it out in their fields, which they also, in their areas around their villages that they used as latrines, they essentially returned their organic matter to the land around their villages. And if you look for the best soils in the Amazon basin today, a place where it's notorious for having horrible soils and all the nutrients are actually in the canopy. One of the reasons why when you clear the forest in the Amazon, you only get about three or four years worth of crops, just like colonial tobacco culture in the southeast, before you've exhausted the soil and eroded it and you move on to clear more forest. Why? Because there's not much in the way of nutrients in the soil to begin with, um, except 
around the villages where there was the highest population density in the Amazon. In other words, people were building the good soils in the Amazon. It was through the actions of higher population density and what people did that improved the land. So why is this all relevant? Well, right now, this century, we face a fundamental problem in terms of our own population projections. Uh, if we're going to have a world of 10 billion some odd people sometime in the next 30, 40 years or so, and pick your demographer and your projection, the curve's going up a lot more before it either flattens off or comes back down. How are we going to essentially feed a growing world if you look out 50 or 100 years? Um, and that question, I think, becomes very pertinent when you actually look at what's forecasted and is not controversial about what's going to happen to oil supplies over the course of the next century. The question about when peak oil is, yeah, we could argue about that. We're probably past it now, if not, if we're not at the hump. But if you look out 50 years, the reality is, is that oil is going to be less available and therefore, if you buy into classical economics at all, a lot more expensive. Is there anybody in this room who thinks the price of oil is going to go down in the next 100 years? I still have yet, I think, unless I'm missing somebody, I've yet to see anybody actually raise their hand when I ask that question. Um, why? Well, it's becoming scarcer. Yet we have an agricultural system that is fundamentally built upon the back of cheap oil. We've also been able to maintain crop yields over the 20th century through a strategy of intensification of fertilizer use. Um, and the question we should be asking at a societal level is can we main this, maintain this strat strategy in the long run as oil supplies dwindle and as prices rise dramatically later this century? If the price of oil goes through the roof, do you think the price of fertilizer is going to not follow? And superimposed on this, there's a growing problem of simply that I started with, the long-term degradation of agricultural land. Um, the, the amount of arable land per person is declining. It's about uh, 0 0.2, I think, uh, hectares per person today. It's declined. To, it's projected to decline by a half down to 0 0.1 by 2050. In other words, we face a confluence of things this century that are going to make it more difficult to feed the world 50 years out. Now, is it impossible? I don't think so, but should we be asking this question, how will we feed a post-oil world without perhaps fertilizer-intensive agriculture, is a question we ought to be wrestling with. Because I'm pretty convinced that 50 or 100 years from now, agriculture will be different. The question is how, not whether. Uh, and in an editorial in the journal Nature a couple years ago, I basically argued that maybe it's time that we ought to start thinking about a greener revolution, what may be called agro, uh, eco-farming, agro-farming, whatever you want to call it. The basic idea is if we need to think, start planning ahead for a world with very expensive oil and expensive fertilizer, we need to be thinking about retooling the way that we grow food in, for ways that will actually be economically competitive 50 years from now. And there's recent reviews in the scientific literature, and a surprising number of them, that indicate the crop yields from no-till and organic agriculture, and sometimes the confluence of both, can match or become close to those from conventional agriculture. Now, the conditions matter in terms of region, crop, particular farm practices? Well, of course, and this is a very general overview. The point that I'm trying to make here, though, is that no matter how one looks at it, restoring native soil fertility, the fertility of the land without additional fertilizers, is going to be important in, for sustaining agriculture in a post-oil, and therefore, I believe, post-cheap fertilizer world. Looking for how to do that, how to go for that, the idea of actually developing the kind of advances in no-till agriculture and cover cropping and uh, eco-farming that could actually bring life back to soils and build soils as a consequence of agricultural production is exactly the kind of thing we need to be doing as a society if we're going to feed everybody on a global scale 100 years out. That's the kind of things I'm, I'm hearing people talk about here and in other no-till farming uh, conferences. I think it's time for a new view of the soil. I'm going to give you essentially a two minute, Dave's two-minute history of how people have viewed soils through the ages before I try and wrap up. But I think that un what underlies, if we're going to change agricultural practices at a large scale, at a national scale, we need to think differently about soil. Um, and if only because of this, this Einstein quote that I, I find so uh, right on, is that the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we, that we were at when we created them we need to think differently about soil. So how have we thought about soil historically? Well, for most of our, um, uh, for most of the last 10,000 years, since the dawn of agriculture, 
Uh, so it's been a mystery. Fertility was to be personified, deified, and revered. This is Ceres, the Greek goddess of agriculture. Um, I have no idea what she'd think about sugared cereals, but she's, um, she was a major figure for a long time. And, and for most of our uh, history, we've, uh, as a species, working the land, that's how we sent, looked at her. Um, for the last 10,000 years, mo much of society has looked at lands as a means to a living. Land was, meant, uh, was to be worked. Um, this has not changed. It will not change. We are dependent upon the land societally for our upkeep. Uh, come the Renaissance, though, there's another dimension added to the problem. Uh, soils were starting to be viewed as a decipherable mystery, as something that could be studied, something that could be understood, something we could tease the mysteries apart of. Leonardo da Vinci wrote in the uh, 1400s that we know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. Oddly enough, that is still true today, 500 years later. Uh, and I don't think that is a good thing. In the 19th century, soil started to be viewed as a chemical reservoir, a medium to be fertilized as needed. Justice von Liebig, when he um, uh, kicked off the modern um, uh, view of fertilizers, was looking at soil as a leaky bucket. If you just plug the hole of the nutrient you needed to, um, um, if you added the stuff that, that you needed to make um, that was deficient in the soil, you could basically prop, prop up crop growth. This is the view that still dominates uh, agriculture today as a, on a philosophical basis, and it's actually right on a chemical basis. There's no evident argument with that. In the 20th century, at the rise of industrialized agriculture, soil became to be viewed uh, dominantly as an industrial commodity to be used and perhaps used up. What do you do with the least valuable input to an industrial production process? You don't worry about wasting it. You don't worry about conserving it. You basically use it. Um, and this is how I would characterize the, the evolution of thinking in the 20th century on soil. In the last two decades, though, there's been almost a revolution in, in soil ecology and soil science that looks at the ecological interplay between organisms living in the soil, the microbes and the, the, the fauna in the soil, and plants, and the, the adaptations between um, uh, the bacteria and, and plant roots turn out to be every bit as specialized and complex as the pollinator and, and flower relationships that we see above ground. We're just starting to understand the dynamics of the subterranean soil ecosystems, but we're starting to see them as ecosystems and something that could be understood and worked with rather than perhaps against. And I think therein lies the great research challenge for the 21st century in trying to actually take the, the science of soil ecology, the sort of the, the real hard nuts and bolts of how do things work in the soil and harness those insights to restructure agricultural technology and the feed the world based on soil building ecological processes and nutrient cycling. And to do this would be nothing short of a revolution in agriculture, but the key elements for that, I mean the fundamental element that you have to have in place to actually pull a revolution like this off is preserving the soil. And I know of no better model or mechanism for doing that as a foundation for sustaining a society than no-till agriculture, large-scale no-till agriculture. It seems to me to be our answer and way out of breaking the historical pattern of soil decline that's affected ancient societies. So first and foremost, if we're going to actually talk about restoring soils at a global pattern, what it means is that, well, frankly, we can no longer treat soil like dirt. And therefore, the real reason for the title of the book is that dirt is soil out of place, there's the pun there, but we have to stop thinking about soil as dirt if we're going to survive as a civilization globally more than about another century out. At least that's my opinion that I think is backed up by the historical record. And as an author, I'll just uh, encourage you to read the book, check it out of the library, get a copy from me, whatever. Um, I have also wrote a book about the environmental history of salmon if you're into fish in the Northwest. And my new book looks at the relationship between science and religion through the view of how geologists have studied the um, story of Noah's flood. So I thank you for your attention, and I thank you for your uh, work in no-till agriculture. It's been a pleasure to address you today.